Well, welcome to Happy Times and Places. This is a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydock, have asked a friend to choose a Doctor Who story, to watch it, and to select their favourite things about each episode. I then watch, commentate along, and try and guess what those favourite things are. Hello, Toby Haydock. Uh, I'm recording for you some things about a Doctor Who story called The Seeds of Doom. Starring Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen. Uh, my name's Chris Chapman, and I what do I do? I make documentaries for the Doctor Who range for the Blu-ray collections at the moment and the DVDs before that. And of course, you know me because you've had the misfortune of being directed by me on lots of different, I think seven different films, haven't you? From Looking for Peter, Living with Levine, Hate It versus Havoc, a Weekend with Waterhouse. The Doctor Who cookbook revisited, looking for Lenny, uh, things like that. Who's Doctor Who revisited? You know, we've had lots of fun. And uh, you've asked me to give you some reasons uh, why I like each episode of a particular story. And The Seeds of Doom was one of the first Doctor Who VHSs I got my hands on. I think it must have come out on video in about 94, didn't it? It was slightly after the anniversary. And... I was in a phase where I, I guess I would have been 13, 14, watching it on video. I used to get up at 6 a.m. Uh, and watch my Doctor Who videos before school because it was the only time I could access the only telly in our house uh, without siblings getting in the way or family. Um, so I would get up at 6 a.m. and watch a couple of episodes every day. And I remember the thing I loved about Doctor Who most at that point was how scary it could be. And even as a teenager, I remember being freaked out by this family show that had an edge, that had a darker kind of nightmarish side. And I loved the cliffhangers and I loved the body horror. And I've always been uh, obsessed with that kind of Cronenberg-y kind of body horror. And maybe Doctor Who's best example of that uh, is The Seeds of Doom, or at least the example I enjoy the most. And I won't say it's a perfect story. Uh, we can talk about some of the flaws, but I love it. Uh, and uh, I don't think that will ever go away. And of course, if you haven't seen it, this is uh, the story of a crinoid pod, don't touch pod, could be dangerous, uh, which is unearthed in, in, in the icy wastes. And uh, a bit like, I guess, the original, they would have thought it was like the, the, uh, the, the Howard Hawks movie, uh, uh, um, uh, the thing from another world based on the book who goes there isn't it which would have been a 50s movie about uh, an antarctic base uh, and an alien involved in that and of course we know it more as john carpenter's the thing from 82 after seeds to do but the, I, the, you have the first two episodes uh, of a pod being an, unearthed uh, the doctor is involved with the World Ecology Bureau for some reason, and uh, he gets dispatched with Sarah to see about this pod. But the pod germinates and infects uh, one of the scientists, and that scientist turns into a kind of uh, green-fingered, awful uh, plant man and starts uh, killing other people. Uh, but Harrison Chase, uh, played by Tony Beckley, uh, obsessed with <laughs> with green things back in England, decides that he wants this pod for himself. Luckily, there are two pods. One gets blown up. The other one uh, he wants for himself, and he sends his mercenary, uh, mercenary Scorby and Keela to get it back, and the Doctor has to stop it getting into his hands uh, from the Arctic back to uh, uh, his mansion uh, back in England. So, and that's, uh, that's the six episodes. So... Uh, I think I understand the rules of this game. I shall give you, for each episode, the things I love best, uh, or the thing, I guess, I love best about each episode. I wrote this down, so I'll try and make sure I get it right. <coughs> well, hello, everybody. That was Chris Chapman um, giving quite a long introduction. Hello, Chris. Uh, he's such a lovely fellow, and yes, he has directed some of the finest documentaries in the Doctor Who range and also some with me in them <laughs> um he he really does uh well I mean all all of the you know all of the all of the Doctor Who DVDs have benefited from some very good people making good documentaries on a tiny budget and and Chris I remember when Chris joined the team me seeing him as this sort of um frightening newcomer because I, I was used by the, the the existing 
team and uh, various people were going off to do other things and I saw this guy come in who Dan Hall was using a lot thought well that's the end of me then because uh, I don't know this guy he's not going to use me and but he he met me for a he met me for a cup of tea in Leicester Square and uh, and I ended up uh, I ended up working with him um, and and I've actually probably worked with him more than anybody else um, and he's uh, he makes very good programs he always makes them look uh, really, really good as you know, excellent production values as well as you know, telling good stories. And he's uh, he's jolly nice and good to work with. And he's chosen the Seeds of Doom, uh, which I will confess is a story I absolutely love. I love the book. I I, I love it uh, now as much as I ever did. We'll we'll talk through maybe the journey I had uh, through you know discovering it on on video and that reconciling that with the 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 target novel um but it's it's one that's pretty much been been up there for me and i think continues to be um even though it's a it's an unusual doctor who story in in many ways but i love it cards on the table i love it so this should be a fairly straightforward uh happy time and place for me so i have it lined up the seeds of doom part one if you'd like to accompany me and chris chapman on our journey to the Antarctic, and I'm going to press play in three, two, one. So, uh, yes, I remember reading the Target novel of this at school. Uh, I, I remember at that point I didn't realise Philip Hinchcliffe had been a producer of Doctor Who. He was just one of the, you know, the Target novelists. Although I got the sense that he was younger. I don't know why than than, than the uh, the original bunch, the Terence Dixes and Jerry Davises and Malcolm Hulks. Uh, who'd written and the David Whittakers, who'd written the uh, the earlier batch. But anyway, um, uh, and so I got this one fairly early when I started to collect. After I'd done a load of the black and whites, and I remember being really disappointed with this shot. Um, uh, I don't I don't know why it just looked f- slightly false to me. I think it's because it's it's sort of stock footage that's got computer snow. Uh, whacked over it and I, I remember a crushing sense of oh no don't say this one's going to let me down too because of course I'd imagined a movie I'd imagined indeed as Chris mentioned The Thing uh, there which is a film that uh, I'd seen before seeing this I, I hadn't seen it when I read the book so you know I imagined it looking like that um, I'm of course reconciled now to Doctor Who not looking like it looks in my imagination and that opening shot is is fine uh i th- i think the computer easter well no it's fine it's fine and this stuff looks great i mean this this is uh uh apart from the false beard that poor old michael mcstay has to wear um and and hubert reese has got one as well haven't they They're, in 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 those you know nowadays i'm i'm sure you would you would grow a beard there would be time um and and i like that with the ice still on the the, the crinoid pod um but yes these these false beards uh, uh, you know, you could you can tell that particularly this Michael McStyre's mobile is it's a, it's a bit flappy. Um, you'd grow them now, but anyway, um, I, I remember loving you know when I started reading the book, loving these characters. It's it's sad coming into it now, knowing that they'll be short lived because here, as we see, they you know you know it, you've got no idea that the story, the whole story, the whole six parts won't be set here. Um. And uh, this is a great opening. Doctor Who in the Antarctic. I get the impression that these guys know each other. Uh, they've, you know, they've got a good rapport. Um, this is, uh, so Michael McStye here, he's uh, still about, he's on the commentary for this actually. Uh, 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 and John Gleeson in the middle, the one without, the, who hasn't uh, had a false beard bestowed upon him. He's been in Genesis of the Daleks. He is the son of Leon Quatermain. Uh, the famous Leon Quatermain. Uh, so he's, he's really, I think, called John Quatermain, uh, uh, John Gleeson. Uh, I have a letter from him, actually, that I've never published. Um, I, actually, I wrote to him during COVID. I, I, I tried to get him for Who's Round, and he left a message for me on Doctor Who's birthday. Um, but he didn't leave his number, and his number didn't show up on my phone. So I couldn't follow it up, and, and I, I sort of let it dangle, and then, then it never happened. So I wrote to him during COVID because... I've lost track of, of a few people. I thought, no, I, I need to, I need to get him here. So, uh, so anyway, he wrote me a nice letter. Um, I, and, and Hubert Reese, the third actor, I think, is a lovely, lovely actor. He's Captain Ransom in the War Games. He's also in Fury from the Deep as the Chief Engineer. I love the way he does that. It, it, it's alive, and he looks like he's gonna 
become the sort of villain of the piece. I mean, he does a he does a mistaken thing, but he actually he becomes quite heroic. But you know, he's got the sort of gleam of the of the z- zealous scientist, um, but also the fear. The way he says, you know, that's it, it's alive. I love the way he does that. Uh, I also adore the way that Tom Baker is immediately in this story. Um, uh, you know, I don't. I don't care why he's helping the World Ecology Bureau. We don't need, um, you know, the brig. You know, to see the brigadier or anybody else saying go and do this and blah blah blah. There he is on the desk, obtuse, sticking his hobnail boots, uh, playing with a a, 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 a yo-yo. Uh, his his hat sort of plonked on his head again in a sort of slightly obtuse kind of way, um, and. Uh, and an excellent foil in Kenneth Gilbert, who I think um, is one of those parts that um, an actor can't really show off doing and the part benefits an actor not showing off. So actually, I think what Kenneth Gilbert does is Dunbar is, is actually more valuable than a lot of the more obvious showy performances in this, because uh, the acting in this, is, I think, is is pretty much 100 percent on point for the whole thing. But I, I, I do particularly like Kenneth Gilbert because I think he does a, a good job with a harder part. Uh, uh, I love that that, that, that Tom Baker, uh, <laughs> the doctor, has his toothbrush. I believe Tom Baker used to um, uh, sort of wander around with a toothbrush in his pocket. Um, but, um, yeah, d- d- and I remember Dunbar being a character in the book. I wasn't that particularly bothered about then he he, you know you you immediately see him and he's he's got a real presence and he was a good strong solid actor Kenneth Gilbert um uh, the lighting in these scenes is marvelous you've got the fact that it's under the ultraviolet lamp uh and uh and of course this is um you know it's it's been growing because they've been because they're scientists and they're curious uh and uh you know that that scientists in an Arctic outpost has become a sci-fi thing. The X Files did one, didn't it? In its in its first season, and this is Doctor Who's go at that, and I I love it for it. Um, I I and you know it's a great sci-fi thing. We have found this object, this this piece of vegetation. What is it? Uh, and this lovely haunting music from Jeffrey Bergen, who did lots of. Stuff of the Royal Shakespeare Company, didn't he? As as well as sort of film and TV scores, and uh, you know, an excellent high quality uh, musician, uh, Douglas Camfield directing. You know, the lights are off or the lights are down, um, but it's it's the attention to detail given to every character um, that makes even a scene like this, which is which is just basically. Um, you know we're we you know the, the the pod is getting a bit bigger but it, it's it everybody's got a little bit of character everybody's got a little bit of intensity and steel and it means that there's there's antagonism even within the exposition which i i like and this is this is beautiful uh, i mean this is quite avengersy isn't it harrison chase with his butler um <laughs> and as i say i've 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 sort of seen it claimed that this isn't really a Doctor Who story, and I, um, I can, I can maybe get on board with that. But the, the whole beauty of Doctor Who is that it has stories that can, that can move away from the template that's been established because it is a flexible format, uh, and Harrison Chase is beautifully uh, introduced uh, with this wonderful dialogue about bonsai being the shrinking of shrubs and trees. I don't know what I imagined uh, Harrison Chase would be like I was uh, from the book but I don't think it was quite like this and Tony Beckley is really interesting casting in fact I just read a review of this that Mark Braxton did on the Radio Times website and he sort of postulates a backstory for Harrison Chase that that Robert Banks Stewart might have enjoyed composing about uh, how he you know he's uh, he was brought up sort of in 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 the East End and sort of cultivated himself because you have that slight slight trace of Cockney from uh, Tony Beckley and he played lots of sort of um, Cockney type villains you know um uh, and and I was really won over by that idea that that, that Mark Braxton put in in his uh, in his uh, uh, review which sort of goes off tangent a little bit um, and, and I think Harrison Chase is a glorious villain with his leather gloves uh, of course that the, the animals have to suffer not the plants um, and 
I, I, again, this is this is sort of beautifully set up. Um, the the dialogue is very good. The performers are very good. Again, Kenneth Gilbert is absolutely solid, and it's what you need against um, Tony Beckley, who's beautifully intense. Um, the the only bit the only bit that slightly jars for me is this bit of paper that uh, that uh, uh, Dunbar produces because it's it's not a map, um, but he just say X marks the spot. Um, uh, so what is it? Is it is it um, you know a map reference maybe? An X marks the spot is just a colloquialism. It just seems. Uh, uh, oh, it's what is it? It's an envelope. It is an envelope with a bit of paper, isn't it? Um, it just doesn't seem quite right to me. I don't know why, because uh, that's definitely not a map. It's just a piece of air. It's just a piece of blank A4. Um, but I love that forethought and initiative and all that stuff about your bureau is concerned with the blue whale and the natterjack. That's all lovely, lovely stuff. And, you know, the set establishes, you know, Chase in this wonderful big gothic house and that all that whack, all that marvellous lush plant life. Uh, behind him which I have to say must have, I've got a cheese plant over there that I bought because it was supposed to be low maintenance and you could have it inside and it's really struggling uh, wonderful John Chalice as Scorby and Scorby is exactly as I imagined him in the book uh, Keeler who they've just mentioned is not which is going to be uh, very much worth talking about but Scorby I you know before when I read the book I didn't even know who John Chalice was who's well known to us now uh, of course, for being uh, uh, Boise and Only Fools and Horses, a comedy character, but he's an excellent heavy. Uh, he's also excellent in uh, uh, Douglas Camfield's Bojess. Douglas Camfield was very good at casting hard men actors, although John Chalice actually considered himself much more of a sort of light comedian, but he had that sort of look uh, that, that lent itself to sort of henchmen, and he's great in this. That's an excellent effect of the tendril coming out and, uh, and, and, and grabbing Winlet by the arm. Um, and and that's you know that's that, that's pretty much it dialogue wise for John Gleason who I think was in a c car accident when he uh, uh, was it him that was in a car accident or was it Michael McStye? Um, there was, yeah, one of one of them had a car accident. Uh, Kenneth Gilbert got chicken pox, uh, but they still managed to to to, to make it all work. Um, and yeah, he's already gone. He's already started to go green. That's a nice little makeup job. And you think he's dead there, but of course he's not. Uh, and Michael Barrington here is the governor in Porridge. So it's cast to the hilt, right, right, all the way down the line. Um, and and he's a type. He's a sort of stuffy civil servant type. That there's still an edge to everybody. C Camfield makes sure that uh, you know if there's a, there's a bit of sort of piss and vinegar to, 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 to every sort of interaction. That's an excellent uh, model shot of the base and the helicopter. That's really high quality stuff. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame that the snow is obviously uh, uh, put on afterwards, but um, considering this is a, this is a you know, low budget, mid 70s piece of television, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great achievement. Uh, Tom Baker is is on wonderful form in this story. This is the first time we've seen Sarah's the young doctor's assistant. Isn't that nice? Um, and I like the fact that the, the, the doctor can just sort of wonder, and that's, you know, wander in and not have to wear any of thing, and, and and actually not have to do what Elizabeth Sladen is doing wonderfully, which is that I've got freezing cold fingers acting. But I like the way Tom Baker waves at the helicopter there. They've just got an eye on, you know, selling the illusion, even though they've not been anywhere near the model or and there's no you know, sort of wind or anything to suggest a helicopter. They're just, you know, it's continuing to sell the illusion. I think, the, you know, the lighting here from the single bulb and the, the, the sort of crampness and, and, and then the, 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 the blocking of this with Baker looming, you know, and I'm, I'm not here to discuss the weather. There's a sick man, you know, it's all, oh, it's all. Uh, and, but Elizabeth Sladen sucking her fingers and I totally buy that she's got sort of really cold chill blains. Um, Baker looked mournful and doom laden. Uh He's, you know, he's so good at, you know, uh, you know, bringing the temperature down, if you'll excuse the pun. And and on, on all of this writing about, oh, he should be dead, you know, uh, and that the infection's spreading so quickly. But look at Baker's mournful countenance. Uh, you know, he's really selling. 
and oh, oh and I had this on a super channel this is this is how I first watched it it had been recorded for me off super channel so that was uh, after I don't think that's going to be suited to Mr. Stevenson that's where the that's where the adverts came in yeah and uh, oh I do like Sarah's uh, hat and, <laughs> and scarf but she really, you know, she sells the, illu the illusion that she's come in from the freezing cold. You know, uh, the actors had to do that sort of thing all of the time to, to remind the audience of time and place. But this, but Baker's, uh, Camfield's so good at shooting this stuff to, to make it seem like, you know, the, the danger is creeping in. And it's something about not only the intensity of the performances that he gets out of people, but just this sort of framing uh, and, and, the, and the feel and the lighting helps as well. But, and it's, uh, I think it's a commitment to realism. It's a, it's a commitment to, to, to the drama of the piece. And, the, and the, you know, it's in the DNA of this story. Um, No, he's half. Uh, but this this was another thing that sort of uh, knocked me sideways uh, w when I first saw it. Is uh, oh, it hasn't it hasn't happened yet. Um, and again, just I like little things like oh, you know, I'm a zoologist. People have their real lives outside of this, and this becomes important. But but even the way that Tom Baker says pod, and as, as I say that you know, there's a real. Uh, he's he's really imparting how terrible this is, and 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 of course it's another nice extra little piece of drama that Stevenson, who you know is pretty much their main ally for these first two episodes. You know he's he's introduced as the guy that you know gets a bit look. This is our pod. I'm not having some weirdo from the government nicking this, but 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 the the, the doctor gets to tell him that he's he's responsible for the destruction of all life on the planet because he is fed the crinoid with light it's it's beautiful uh, uh and it just means that as i say every interaction there are consequences there's drama uh this is lovely just this nice little bit where you know he says to his friend you know we're doing everything we can um it's just it's 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 sort of human and it's believable but i mean this story has hit the ground running and we sort of we know these people and you know we've, we we feel a bit for for charles because because he he's obviously friends of of mobley here um paul connell i'm sure put a character called derek mobley in a in a, an episode of casualty who i think then came back so i think there's a, a, a semi-recurring well, it's only in a couple of episodes, but uh, in, in the TV series Casualty, uh, there's there's a character called Derek Mobley, and I'm sure it was Paul Cornell who did that. I think so. Uh, and again, we're straight to the the nub of the story, which is which is uh, uh, great. Is that because of Doctor Who's knowledge? I even love the way he moves his hat up with his ice pick. I mean, he just does everything so brilliantly. Um, and it's the sort of casual, it's the casual way he, he saunters, but it's not glib at all because he has such presence and such uh, de deportment that, you know, you, you, he, he's, 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 never, he's never undermining it, but he has a, he has a casual power about him. But um, all this stuff about they travel in pairs like policemen. But again, we don't need to worry about why um, the Doctor knows this because the Doctor knows loads of stuff. Now, if the Doctor knows loads of stuff that gives us the answer, that's bad drama because it's just like, well, that came out of nowhere and just because the Doctor is a, is a time lord. Um, but, but the fact... But, but to get the story going, the Doctor knows what the crinoid is and that they come in pairs, so we've got the other pod, so that then we've got the second piece of the drama that's going to open the story out a bit later. Again, it's just done with such economy. It's, it's using the strengths of the series very, very intelligently. Um, uh, which which means we can you know get much more interesting things going on than the sort of boring establishing of the law or whatever. Um, and and this is uh, as I say, this is a uh, well. I'll get to it now because he, he says crinoid shortly, and I for years thought you know when I read the book I thought it was called a crinoid. So it. it immediately it sort of knocked me off my stride of enjoying the story um uh because it sounded wrong to me um 
Now, this is all great, all this stuff about schizophytes and plant bacteria. Just the way that this dialogue is, is, is done uh, makes it very believable. Tom Baker has obviously decided he's been a bit mournful throughout. So, you know, he suddenly gets that gleam and that, that pretty, you know, he's pretty unpleasant, the fourth doctor sometimes. Uh, you know, he's more fascinated by the idea that the, the blood's turning into vegetable soup than he is worried about Winlet at that moment. But that's him being sort of disconcertingly alien. And, you know, otherwise the doctor has been a bit sort of you know stern for 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 for, for quite a while um and the stuff about the freezer you know that's that's nicely done the dialogue that it, it, it explains why they've got a freezer you know it helps to make sense of it for the for the audience but it's interesting dialogue too uh, he's just said about the, the crinoid now so the doctor knows this stuff which is which is great um and i love this because it's the adding of the music to the you know to the explanation of what the monster is and and it's quite nice that the doctor doesn't actually know but you know they don't they don't really they just know enough about it that it's this thing that probably wanders through space and affects people and that's all that you need to know and it stops the doctor being a total know-all uh, he doesn't know the answer and the, and the doctor knowing the answer wouldn't help the the, the story and all this stuff about um you know, positing the idea that it's because it's got t turbulence on the planet's surface is 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 sort of guesswork, uh, and that's sort of I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and, and and it's and it shows that he's not, you know, he's not a know-it-all. Compare that to the to the stuff in the um what the 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 Scandi mirror frog chair episode from uh, more recent to where Jodie Whittaker has about three pages of dialogue explaining what the monster is that may as well be blah de blah de blah de blah de blah name of monster blah de blah de blah de blah and and it and it takes ages and it's not very dramatic and it doesn't really help with the story either um whereas the the the, the explanation there has it has mood and it has character and it has drama w w w within it i think it's really artfully very very well done um uh and this is this is great because you know the doctor is very single-minded and focused here uh, that he doesn't fatally doesn't pay attention to the two interlopers because he's got no need to think that they're bad guys. Um, Keeler in the book is cannon fodder from the beginning. He's the he's the slightly weak-willed scientist. Uh, in this story, I think he's a really interesting. And good character because again, uh, you, you know you you, you, I, you you could easily forgive a bad performance as Keeler because he'd be not very likable, a bit weak-willed, uh, and the guy that you knew was going to die. Mark Jones does so much more with it, but we will come to that because we've got plenty of time to spend with him. I love the Doctor's behaviour here. I mean, it's really hard for a Doctor to be this unlikable, where he's spiky with Mobley here. And then, oh, you're going to be the one, and he always does it as a, with a smile, you're going to be the one that's going to uh, chop his arm off. And, and, and he then doesn't give the answer. He says, you must help yourself. And, make, uh, uh, selves. and it's Sarah that has to give the answer. But that's great because that, um, that empowers her. You know, the Doctor's willful um, uh, mysteriousness, rather than giving the answer, he leaves it to Sarah to do, but that makes Sarah... This is, a, you know, this is a, an A-positive scene for, for for Sarah here. She's she's being the driver here, and she's worked out that, you know, you're the, you're the one, Mobley. You know, Mobley is dead by the end of this episode, but this is a, a really important scene for him where, the, you know, the pressure is put on this minor character in the, in the, in the whole, you know, the landscape of the whole of the story. Uh, and actually, that's a really nice note for the Doctor at the end to say, you're a good man, you know. But that whole scene is about piling pressure on this guy that we barely know. And yet we feel his dilemma, the way that the dialogue is written, that each of the characters gets something to contribute to give to him and, and, and what that then does to him. I think that's a wonderful scene where this guy, who's literally within seconds is now going to die, uh, has, has, that, has that terrible pressure put upon him and rises to the challenge you know that's the that's the doctor's thing about you know you know people when when the stuff hits the fan you know do what is brave that's what inspires us when what's doctor as a kid you know seeing people being brave in 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 
in, in the sight of danger. And, and then we have this, this cliffhanger, which I'm, I, I, sadly, I think for me, is possibly the weakest moment of the story because he dies too quickly. Um, uh, you know, he's sort of dead by the time he hits the floor, but he's, ba- he's barely been uh, uh, throttled. Um, and, and that and the combination of the false beard and, and I don't like his red jacket either um uh the, the, yeah it's it's odd it's it's a, it's a final moment that doesn't quite uh that, that that doesn't quite do it which is a shame because it's uh it's otherwise I think it's it's pretty much perfect it's a it's it's a wonderful piece of doc too and and I know Chris Chris enjoys this uh I, th- I think we've we've we've, come, we've we've spoken more recently via WhatsApp about stuff, and I said I was about to do this, and uh, he he said you know he thinks the the first two episodes are uh, you know perhaps his favourite bits of, of of who, and I do love that. I mean I th- I, I I don't think they put a foot foot wrong there. I think it's I think it's really terrific. Uh, this is my sort of go to. I remember watching this with the snow outside and uh, a log fire. This is this is a Sunday afternoon winter sunday afternoon story uh, to me and i had it on a scotch tape uh, the claws of axos one to four uh seeds of doom one to three and then on the other scotch tape i had seeds of doom four to six and the time warrior one to four now i'd asked for frontier in space in the middle i'd wanted them all to be pertwee uh but and then i would had a separate tape where i wanted the seeds of doom uh all on its own but uh, the guy who did them for me had had, had done them in a different order i guess he did what was to hand so i was always slightly annoyed that i'd got a tom baker sandwiched in between some john pert which i didn't like mixing my <laughs> mixing my doctors um i really enjoy that oh there's so much that is good about that uh, um i just i mean i think tom baker is on such good form i think it's a brilliant performance of his the way that he does everything that i love about his doctor from that what rob schumann describes in running through corridors at one point about his quiet danger uh, but that that sort of uh, universal mournfulness that he has but also that you know you know hobnail booted insolence uh, with which he sort of uh glides but the, the, but then also that you know the, the the way that he you know he he stands there in the cold he sort of he's like olympian almost but olympian you know d- dressed uh, d- dressed in almost an anti-godlike way he's oh he's so good and elizabeth sladen is so good it's a top-notch cast i think it's a perfect cast i think everybody's great um yeah everybody i mean i've not mentioned hubert reese enough i think i think he does a brilliant job as stevenson he's got that sort of quiet intensity about him um douglas camfield's direction is gorgeous the sets are excellent um the outside work and uh, you know of the snow is really good um i think my favorite bit about the my favorite thing about that I mean, i'm tempted to say tom baker because it's so easy sometimes, I think, to take the Doctor for granted. Um, but I think everything that I think is great about... And I love the establishing stuff with Harrison Chase as well. I love I love that, that establishing scene with him and Dunbar. I love the way that the story gets into itself at such a, such a pace, such a lick. But I think I'm going to choose the scene because it doesn't need to be there. And it, and, it, and it encapsulates everything that I think is great about this era of the show is that you have a scene where a character who's not long for this world has a big dramatic moment and everybody's dialogue contributes to that. The director's got the atmosphere ratcheted up, all the actors are doing well and, and, the, and the script is excellent. And that's the scene where they make Moberly realise that he's going to be the one to amputate someone's arm. This is children's television at tea time and we're talking about... Amp- and of course, they don't get to it. They never get to do it. But... The idea is that things are so bad, we're going to have to chop somebody's arm off uh, in the Antarctic. Oh, <laughs> I think I just think everything about that is so brilliantly judged. And it's got such a wonderful atmosphere. So I'm going to choose the scene where they tell Moberly uh, that he's going to have to amputate his friend's arm. But I uh, and, and partially because of Sarah's role in it as well. And the doctor's, the, 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 you know, the doctor's behavior in it. It's all it's all great but i could have chosen anything really i think it's an episode as i say that doesn't really put a foot wrong what has oh i do like doctor who what has chris chapman chosen about part one of the seeds of doom 
So uh, I guess, I don't know, I was like, do I have to pick something uh, obscure so it's not the same thing that you pick or should I just pick from the heart? So I'm trying to just pick from the heart and to give you the things I really like. Uh, and I think uh, certainly in episode one, yeah, in episode one, I think, and I, and I do love the first two episodes probably more than the rest of the story in this case. I think those are my very favourite and I love the atmosphere. I'll tell you my second favourite thing about episode one is we always talk about how good Douglas Canfield is and he's a genius in this. And this is kind of, this plus Zygons ending up in the same season. I know they weren't meant that way, but ending up in the same season for me is kind of the height of Canfield. Um, and what I love about Canfield's direction here is actually, it's one of the few Doctor Who stories where the the indoor uh, recording, the uh, the video recording inside on the sets is better than the outdoor recording. That's partly because they did the outdoors on video, uh, you know, so it doesn't have that usual film grainy single camera kind of quality. But presumably they still shot at single camera uh, because the 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 outside stuff that they do uh, with the quarry dressed in fake snow isn't great. But I would say that the indoor studio direction is some of probably the best studio direction in classic Doctor Who, if you watch episode one and the way that Canfield uses close-ups in that Arctic base, it is stunning. And it feels like a movie. When you watch like, you know, without being mean, when you watch some uh, maybe kind of early 80s Who, the studio stuff can feel quite stagey and, and like there are lots of people in each shot and they're kind of lining up sometimes. Uh, and Canfield makes it really cinematic. And, and there's a real atmosphere to the lighting and, and a real love of getting really in close on those terrified faces in episode one, which I love. And I, I'd put it up there with, say, I've always loved Michael Bryant's direction of the studio stuff in The Green Death. You know, if you watch that, he's moving his camera in a far more inventive way than what we're used to on these things. And uh, But Seeds of Doom, Canfield's direction, that's my second favourite thing about episode one. But my favourite thing is how alien the Doctor is. And this is kind of, I guess it's, it's taking that, that um, side of Tom's performance that we've already seen in Pyramids of Mars, the uh, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not from Earth. I, I walk in a I'm a time lord. I walk in eternity and that kind of aloof, distant quality. And I think it's never better than in Seeds of Doom episode one. So my number one thing is Tom's Doctor in episode one. Tom's alien performance, combination of Tom and direction and and Robert Bank Stewart's script. But particularly for me, that scene when the Doctor and Sarah come into the base for the first time, when uh, when the scientist brings them in and it's it's him and Sarah in the foreground and the Doctor that kind of towers over them behind him in the shadows. And they're all make, making niceties and he's just kind of completely ashen faced and, and, and get on with it. And, and, and you know, we, we, we talk about uh, that sense of the Doctor saying, you know, you, you must help yourselves and not wanting to get involved with amputating arms and so on. But him being grumpy, you know, the, he says at that point, I haven't come uh, 10,000 miles to discuss the weather. And and I I can go back to Tom's performance in Seeds of Doom episode one again and again. And uh, he's great in Zygon's one as well, actually, with Canfield. But I might say that his, that, that kind of involved but not involved, you know, a hint of that kind of, godlike thing that we i guess we, we're used to in the modern series but there's a darkness and there's a compassion and there's an alienness to tom in episode one of the seeds of doom which i adore and so tom is my thing for episode one. Oh, i was just so close i was gonna say the doctor um but people don't normally say the doctor so i didn't um ah so near yet so far but i like that it's, it's because he does have moments of compassion if he was just dark it wouldn't work and he takes it about as dark as you can go but there's always the hint of a sort of uh, m mercurial inquisitiveness and and joyous in discovery about him that that's beneath the surface of that but tom baker dares to be dark and difficult and dangerous and, and to me growing up you know doctor who was was great fun he was a great fun character but but and I, I maybe I didn't pick up or maybe I, it didn't matter to me that there's so many moments where th this doctor is sort of mournful and has the weight of the universe on him. And I think that's the genius of Tom Baker. I think it's perhaps because he looks so sort of wild in his um, 
Uh, and, and yet it's a wild outfit that doesn't look wild on him because he is big enough to carry off, uh, and not just physically, but his presence is big enough to carry off the, 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 the scarf and the hat and the long coat and not look awkward. You know, it, it, it looks like, you know, he's, you know, he carries it off. He carries it off. And he, yeah, it, it is a really good performance from Tom Baker in that episode. Um, and that's what, you know, my choice had, had elements of that within it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was nearly there, Chris, but uh, I don't get the point for that. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magnificent episode and, t- and Tom Baker is on towering form. And yes, he, he is similar uh, in, in Zygons and it, that has that similar intensity, that, that sort of, and it's the music as well. That, and, and, and Camfield has it dripping with atmosphere. Uh, and whatever he says to his actors, he somehow he gets them to contribute so much to this this universal atmosphere that that his stories have. And I think particularly, yeah, in in these these two bakers, it, it, well, no, in, in, in so much of his stuff, but it's it certainly I'm thinking of the two bakers because I'm watching one of them. Um, yeah, really good. Oh, well, I was going to go to bed, but I think I'm going to watch another episode of the Seeds of Doom because, uh, well, they do come in pairs, like policemen. (laughs) Evening all. Well, thank you very much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydoke. My special guest is Chris Chapman, who can be found on Twitter at ChrisChapman81, because he's 81 years old. No, I think he must have been born in 1981. Really? That's awful. Uh, (laughs) How can he be so young? Anyway, thanks to him and to the many patrons who make these podcasts possible. And they include Ruben Herfindahl, Stephen Moffat, not that one, Charles Coffin, Graham Cooley, Mark Clues, Kevin Clark, Steve Churchill, Susan Christian, Ralph Chilton, Phil Chapman, Anthony Carroll, Tim Burrows, Hugh Buchtman, David Brody, Gareth Bowley, Robin Bland, Peter Blackett, Richard Bignall, Andy Benison, Ollie Barrett, Stephen Bamford, Richard Alt, Simon Ash, Radit Aurisa, Tilt Auriza, Sebastian April, Kit Allen, Mark Aldridge, Keith Adams, Joel Ahrens, Stephen White and Sidney Wilson. The music is by Dave Gates, the artwork Dylan Patterson. Oh, I do get those names right out to the bitter end, don't I? Um, if you would like to join their number, please do so by going to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. Uh, it's a way that I can keep these broadcasts ad free. So it'd be really annoying if I was making some boring observation about the uh, <laughs> bottom reaches of an actor's CV and suddenly I had to break off and go, do you like shaving and hate being cancelled? Then sh- shave with my things. Uh, and or, or what's the other one? Oh, it's it's the it's the delivery, isn't it? Can you not cook because you're so busy? We'll send it to you in bags and you don't even have to measure things. Cooking now. Yes, see, I wouldn't do it very well. Um, uh, uh, so um, <laughs> so uh, we're, instead of that, if, uh, pay, well, I mean, I'm, no, I'm going to do it like this anyway. This is not how you advertise, is it? Um, don't, don't bother, pay, don't bother becoming a patron because I'm not going to use advertising anyway. But, but, but if if you do, it justifies my faith in humanity that, uh, well, no, it's not a faith in humanity. You can listen to this for free if you like, because that's what we do nowadays. I listen to loads of podcasts that I don't pay for. Um, so, no, I'm not even making a point about humanity. You, But you justify my decision not to put adverts in these things because I would feel awful doing them and I don't like them on podcasts. So what I'm saying is the patrons, those names you heard, they make that possible. No, it's possible anyway, because that, that's how I'm going to do it. They they, they justify me doing it because uh, they enable me to... They buy a little time for me to do... To then waste doing this sort of stuttering, uh, self-correcting, whatever this is. I mean, I don't know, even know what this is. It's, it's certainly not broadcasting. Waffle in a cupboard. So... Pay me to waffle in a cupboard, if you like, by going to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. There are advanced releases. If you're listening to to this now, you could have been listening to it six months ago, is what I'm saying. Now, six months ago. Imagine how much more fun this would have. As, I'm, as, I, as uh, patrons are listening to this at the height of summer, 
Uh, I suspect you will be in the dark days of winter. And that's no good for a cricket match, except I've just done... Actually, I've just done Black Orchid. This is The Seeds of Doom. The Seeds of Doom is a very wintry story. It's actually probably better if you're not a... No, that's, that's not... No, it's not. It's awful. Oh, God, this is... What an awful time you must be listening to this, being a non-patron. Uh, it's probably around Christmas time. I don't know when it is, because it's so far in the future, I don't even know. The world could have ended. And imagine... Imagine how much better your life would have been before the, uh, the the apocalypse that consumed us all had if you'd spent some time listening to me talking about episode one of The Seeds of Doom. <sighs> but if you don't want to be a patron, and after that I can understand why you might actively object to being one, and fair enough, you can go to ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, uh, where you can do a one-off uh, donation of any amount that you like, and you don't have the monthly commitment, uh, which you do have on Patreon, but uh, at Patreon you do get the advanced releases, the special material, pictures of my dog, three releases a week, oh, all sorts of stuff. And also with the Patreon, if you sign up for a year, in advance, you get a 10% discount off the total price and tiers start from as little as £3 a month. The Kofi option, uh, you are not limited uh, or dictated uh, by amount. You can you can donate whatever you like, should that take your fancy. But what costs nothing, and I understand in these very tight financial times, I mean, our, our electricity bill has doubled. Um, and I don't use it. I sit in a dark cupboard uh, yelling into the ether. So I don't know what the illumination Magoo upstairs is uh, is doing with... Uh, she must be having some sort of light show. But anyway, I mean, it, it, it'd make you weep if you saw our uh, uh, our uh, electricity bill. Well, no, it'd make you weep if it had your name on it, with my name on it. You should probably go, idiot. Uh, anyway, um, so what's that? So, yes, anyway, these financial times, I know times are tough. So... Um, what costs you nothing and what would be really appreciated is if you went to iTunes and gave these a five star rating and perhaps a couple of lines of review to lure people into the part of the spider's web that is the internet or oh, that's no that I thought web I thought sp lure into a spider's web there's a metaphor there and if there is I didn't quite find it um, anyway yes Put, do a good review, please. It will make people perhaps listen to this. And if they listen up to, to this point, by God, they're going to be grateful to you. So, yeah, um, ratings, reviews, please spread the word. Uh, I don't have an advertising budget or anything like that. So if you could just tell the world via cyberspace, that would be lovely. <laughs> So yeah, I let you into a little secret there, didn't I? I've recorded the closing credits for Black Orchid and probably the first two episodes of The Seeds of Doom in the same session. So there's one for the archivists who are, I'm sure, painstakingly chronicling the development and execution of the obscure podcast series Toby Haydock's Time Travels. People, people have done more. I'm Honestly, no, I don't really think people are doing that. Um, it's terribly this time. It used to be you could joke about something and people would go, oh, he's joking about that. It seems now people people, people take pe what people say on on the surface um, at face value, which is terrible when your sense of humour tends to be sort of quite self-deprecatory. So I will say something uh, that I think is an obvious falsehood about something being marvellous. People go, God, he, th he thought that was marvellous. No, that's the joke. I'm saying the complete opposite of what is true. And people go, why would you say the opposite of what is true? People are very credulous these days, aren't they? So you have to be very careful. Um, I think each every joke you do now has to come with sort of accompanying literature going, with caveats going, now when I said this, I didn't mean this. Um, but there we go. Those are the times we live in. Um, what am I talking? I don't know. I like the seeds of doom, though. I love the seeds of doom so i'm going to have great fun doing this particular story and it's lovely that chris chapman uh, is the person that's chosen it because chris has been responsible for some of my uh, most enjoyable times being a doctor who person um you know uh, d d making uh, making documentaries on the blu-ray and dvd range so 
I'm in a. I'm actually in my sick bed. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm supposed to be being poorly, but uh, I've just done a, 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 an episode commentary for a Doctor Who DVD, and I think Erin Dawes thinks I'm still doing that, which is why I can get away with talking to you now. It's like we're having an affair, essentially. She thinks I'm ill. Well, I am ill. I'm supposed to be in bed being ill, uh, but I've come downstairs to have a little bit of a liaison with uh, you guys so uh you know let's let's call this our little secret let's, let's, let's just keep this between ourselves i, I actually that i thought that was quite creepy sorry